Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer. So maybe one of us can uh, please lead in prayer. Go ahead. Anybody can lead. Father, we thank you for this time, Lord, for the lessons for your presence. Lord, that you would minister to us with your hand pressed upon us, God, as we continue to learn this morning. You would teach us uh, your strategies that we need to uh, build on ourselves, oh God, and help us to uh, apply this in our personal lives, Lord Jesus. And help us also to minister according to these standards that you are teaching us, God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, John. All right, so last week uh, we did chapter seven. We talked about innovation and creativity. And our God is a God who gives us strategies. He gives us ideas, the, 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 the ability to innovate, to think, to give us strategies. And we looked at scriptures as well, how God uh, gave strategies to the people of Israel. Uh, and even in the New Testament, in the early church, God was there with them. Right. So in our workplace, in our ministries, keep asking God, keep growing, keep developing. Now, we're going to a very important topic, uh, which is chapter eight, talking about people, processes, performance and rewards. Right now, the first thing we think about when we say people, right? when, we, when, we, when we talk about ministry, when we talk about business, uh, uh, whether it's small scale, large scale business, what is the first thing that comes to our mind? At least for me, the first thing that comes to my mind is people, right? Ministry is about people. It's not about the programs, the events, all that is there, but it's done for the people, right? Uh, so whether it's ministry or business, people are important. The people that we work with, the people that we are serving is very, very important. Right? And, and where there is people, we must understand there's going to be uh, you know, conflicts, there's going to be, there's need to be teamwork, there need to be a way to uh, you know, resolve conflicts, there, there must be employee motivation, there must be performance evaluation, not everyone are wired the same, everyone come with different abilities, different capabilities, different thoughts, different mindsets. Uh, and so when you talk about people, uh, there's so much that we can learn, right? Uh, uh, especially in ministry, uh, you may have people who are always with you, you know, with you, they're with the vision. We have people who, uh, you know, have a lot of questions. They have a lot of, uh, you know, oh, why is this being done this way? Why is this being so? They, people are wired differently. So let's look at a few fundamental principles when it comes to dealing and treating people, right? Now, these are biblical principles and can be used and must be used both in ministry and in business, okay? So let's look at this. Pair fairly based on contribution and value to the organization. Colossians 4.1. Masters, give your bond servants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, before I go ahead, I just want to bring this forth. Now, there will be, there, you may not be in a place where, you know, you don't decide a person's, uh, you know, pay or wages, right? That's all right. But what is the, what is the, some principle that we can gain from here? You know, treat people the way, in a way that is right, that is pleasing to God. Now, in terms of if you are in a position to, you know, talk about uh, uh, pay for your employees, pay them for the work they do and pay them fairly. Right? As long as, you know, there is mutual understanding that, you know, the remuneration that is being paid is good, it's fair, it's just, uh, we are doing what the scripture says. Right. Now, there are times when people come with loads of experience, 10 years, 12 years of experience. Uh, yes, the, you know, the pay uh, or the remuneration can change, can vary, but that is not the indicator 
that you know this person's got 10 years experience so i have to give him so much no it's also about the value they bring to the organization the the work that they're able to do right now for example you have a 25 year old and a 40 year old applying for the same position uh, but the 40 year old has 10 years of experience which is very important right that's an intangible asset but the 25 year old is willing to learn is willing to you know uh, just give everything that he or she has for the organization um but if we don't pay that 25 year old well what's going to happen uh he or she may not put in their full effort right they may not uh, you know, have the experience, but you never know that 25 year old may be able to grasp things that are happening in the market in a greater way than the one who was, uh, who is much more tenured, right? So never permit a culture of entitlement to set in, right? The moment people operate, you know, from the idea that they have the right to be in that organization, they deserve the role, they deserve the position in that organization what happens they are operating out of a sense of entitlement right uh, they're operating out of a sense of entitlement uh, now what happens when we operate out of a sense of entitlement it impairs our performance there is uh, lethargy it demoralizes others right so everyone in the organization whether they are five years two years in the organization or whether they're 20 years in the organization everyone um, must be paid in terms of what they can bring to the organization right uh, yes there are organizations like if you look at the corporate sector there are organizations and companies which offer you know, higher pay for certain companies, they have offer higher pay, uh, you know, they say, hey, why don't you join here, I'll give you a higher pay, all that is there, right? Uh, but again, we talked about it previously, right? It's not only about money, but the intangibles, what you're able to bring to the company, your relationships with your bosses, your relationship with your uh, with your co-employees, your, your, uh, the way that you're able to perform, are they, you know, uh, all, all these all these different aspects are involved, right? So, when we are in a position to, you know, recruit and and have people in your organization or ministry, pay them fairly according to what they bring to the organization, right? Second one, ensure people are paid on time. Leviticus nineteen thirteen says, "Do not rob or take advantage of anyone." Do not hold back the wages of someone you have hired, not even for one night. Right? Uh, now, usually most companies and most places, we have a cycle of a one month uh, salary payments. Or if you look to the West, uh, I don't know what, how it is in Africa and other countries, uh, uh, but most of the countries uh, in you know uh, follow this routine of either the two week cycle or the monthly cycle so in india it's mostly the you know the monthly cycle of salary pays uh, but here's the thing it is important that people are paid on time because people have commitments they have you know, family who depend on them and they have family members they have children there uh, and and the bible says when we don't pay people on time it is against God's plan. It's regarded as a sin. And look at this, Deuteronomy 24, 14 and 15. Do not cheat poor and needy hired servants, whether they are Israelites or foreigners, living in one of your towns each day before sunset. Pay them for the day, that day's work. They need the money and have counted on getting it. If you do not pay them, they will cry out to you. They will cry out against you to the Lord, and you will be guilty of sin. Right? Now, this can be, you know, uh, uh, you know, there are times when you know the organization may be going through challenges. Cash is, you know, just not coming in. There's no influx of cash, or uh, there there could be a delay in the payment payments, right, of salaries. But that time, in those times, 
let the staff know that this is what is happening. Please bear with us. We will have it. Uh, uh, we will have your uh, salary being paid. But I've heard of many, many organizations right, where if a person puts down their papers, and I have, I know people, they put down their paper, they have three months uh, of, you know, the, the uh, uh, time which they have to work, uh, the three month period. Uh, and, you know, the organization would either wouldn't pay them, they would say, you did this, you did that. Uh, uh, and, and so it becomes a challenge. Now, the Bible says it is a sin. Right? Uh, we are not a hold back. Right? And now, uh, even in ministry, you know, we may have people coming, doing some small labor or, uh, you know, helping out in the church, or there may be people who, uh, vendors that we may use, um, anything, right? Uh, like, for example, at APC, we have a lot of things that we hire out. Right, so from our LED screens to uh, we have a lot of vendors, our cameras. Uh, so a lot of lot of hiring happens. But we make sure that people are paid on time. And, and one of the things that we do is we pay them beforehand, right? so that you know uh, we know that uh, they are happy with us, and and you know we can they they there's a trust that has already been built. Right? So many a times. Uh, you know, uh, when we make these payments, we've already paid them for it. Now they come with a whole heart to serve. Like right? whatever they're doing, they do it so well. Uh, why? Because we've honored their requests. Right? Uh, pay vendors, pay consultants, and other services. Pay them on time. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. Right? Do not withhold good. Uh, and let us make this a practice. Whether we are in ministry or whether we are in business, whether we are even talking to the people around us, right? Uh, people in business around, uh, we must not you know, hold back or we must not hold back things that belong to them, which they deserve, right? And, and the serious part is it says that God looks at it as a sin, right? Next one, don't exploit people, don't hold back their wages. Jeremiah 22, 13, doomed to him who builds palaces but bullies people, who makes a fine house but destroys lives, who cheats his workers and won't pay them for their work. Now, Jeremiah is writing this uh, to Israelites who have gone into captivity. Right Now, we must understand there were some rich Israelites, there were some poor. Uh, so there were people who are also working under the Jews who were rich. There were people uh, working under the Babylonian rule, right? Now, to them, he, you know, Jeremiah is saying, God, you know, when we're doomed to those who build palaces, but bully other people who cheats his workers and won't pay them for their work. And he's saying, okay, you go work in the field. They come in the evening, I'll pay you for it. And then when evening comes, hey, uh, I promised 10 dinars, but I noticed that you took a, uh, you know, the, the ground was not tilled properly, or you did not, you know, do the work effectively. I see that it's still, so I'm not going to give you 10 dinars. What is that? That's exploiting people, right? Uh, that's cheating people. Uh, now, yes, you can correct them, right? As, as, uh, as an employer, you can correct them. You say, see, uh, I expected this to be done in this time, but it was not done. But however, I'm giving you, what I promise, but going forward, uh, you'll be paid according to what work you have, you have done. So that is okay. But don't hold back wages. Don't exploit people. Now, uh, especially this happens in, uh, uh, you know, in our nation. I don't know about other nations, but in India, now we have these small vendors, vegetable vendors, fruit vendors out in the streets. And... Uh, you know, we try to go there, we purchase whatever fruits, vegetables. And most often, most often, uh, people begin begin to bargain and say, hey, you know, make it, you know, 10 rupees lesser or make it 20 rupees lesser. And uh, it's something that I personally don't do because the reason I don't do it is because I believe that, you know, they're doing a small business they're not going to make much out of it. 
right? They have a family, they have a, they probably have wives, they have children, they have expenses, and they need the profit out of it. Right? The moment I go bargaining about of it, uh, how am I going to be a blessing to them? You know, they may give it. Okay, we ought to take it since I need some kind of business. Uh, but what's going to happen? Uh, you know, it's it's like exploiting them. It's obvious they're doing a business. They are selling it at a higher rate than what they bought it for, because it's a business, right? They have to make some money out of the, what they're doing. Uh, and so, you know, this is something that I always tell people, uh, especially people that I know very close to me. I tell them, well, don't walk in with these, you know, these small vendors out in the streets. You know, they're selling. I'm bugging with them. Right? They, it's not much that they get in life. It's what they have is what they survive on. It's, it's their daily bread. So uh, in return, be a blessing to them. Yeah, they say this is you know, fifty rupees. Give them a hundred rupees. If God has blessed us, right? Uh, give them extra. Be a blessing to them. Don't exploit people. Right? Uh, never, never. Next point. Never exploit the poor and the powerless. Deuteronomy 24.14 You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether one of your brethren or one of the aliens who is in your in your land within your gates. Right Now, one of the dangers of uh, wealthy people is what they do is they exploit the poor. Right, they, So they look at the poor, the powerless, hey, he can't do anything. So so I'll, I'll pay him next week. Now, um, or I'll pay him when I get the money, or I'll pay this person for his work. Uh, uh, let him keep asking. You know, what is this? This is called oppression. And God's instruction is that we must not oppress or exploit the poor and the needy. Never do that. If it is in our ability to give what we have promised uh, to a person for their pay, for their work, what they have done, do it. Don't hold back. Right? Uh, look at these couple of verses in Proverbs. Proverbs talks a lot about it. Proverbs 22, 2 verse 22 and 23. Do not rob the poor because he is poor, nor oppress the afflicted at the gate. For the Lord will plead their cause and plunder the soul of those who plunder them. Proverbs 14 31. He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him have mercy on the needy. Look at this, Proverbs 22, 16. He who oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he who gives to the rich will surely come to poverty. Right. So, so basically, all these verses say, don't exploit the poor. Now, they can't take you to court. They can't take you to, you know, they can't come and fight with you and say, hey, you know what, you said this, but you know. They're poor, they're, they're needy people, they're, they're helpless, right? Uh, never explore them. And thank God, you know, the you and I as believers, I'm sure we won't do that, right? Because the Holy Spirit is in us and we have learned to walk in love. Uh, and we know that our heart needs to be right before God. But sometimes unknowingly, uh, we may, you know, hold back good from people. So let's not do that. Uh, whether they're poor, whether they're needy, let's be a blessing to them, right? Uh, let's look at the next one. Higher right, retain and review. Right? Proverbs 26.10, an employer who hires any fool that comes along is only hurting everybody concerned. You know, these two versions are like the Good News Bible and the Message Translation. They both very stern and very accurate in the way they bring things across. Look at this. An employer who hires any fool that comes along is hurting, is only hurting everybody concerned, meaning he's hurting the entire team, he's hurting the entire organization. So what's the what's the uh, important point that we can take from here? Hire people, hire the right people, hire people who can be a benefit to your organization, who can affect your organization, who can upskill and make your organization more effective. Hire right. Hire the right people. Now, 
of course you know people send in their reg resumes or you, you know you go through the hiring process now whether it is church whether it is ministry higher right how do we do that you can have certain things set in place right now i remember you know before i joined uh, you know a bible college and all that um, you know, I, I remember that there was in the corporate sectors, there were, you know, these rounds of interviews. It was not like, oh, because you know something, you can get into the yoke. Uh, even if it was a call center, basically just talking to people, they had like three rounds. The uh, first one was, you know, uh, they would talk to you, uh, get to know you, uh, you know, how is your uh, talking skills, right? Uh, how is your communication skills? All of that, right? Second round would be around with the, uh, you know, probably how to use the computer, uh, how to work on Excel and Word doc, or they would give you some, uh, you know, uh, writing test, or basically a test on the uh, aptitude test is what they call it. So, so that was used to be the second round, and the third round uh, would be the round with the ops. It's called the ops interview. I don't know what's happening now at the corporate sector, but the third round would call be called the operations interview so that would be the main interview so you're talking with the you know the bigger heads of the company and then they ask you what do you want to do in this organization what can you bring into this organization so three rounds so there's a process and after the third round uh they say okay we'll email you let you know whether you got in uh and then you hire and uh, hire those people uh, but sometimes in ministry what we do is we think okay no we can just take people however they are no. Uh, now, when you look at things, how ministry is turned out, you know, everything's going online, everything is, uh, you know, upskilling, everything, you know, in ministry, everything is, the standards are raise, raising higher and higher. Right? So you need a good IT team. Just because a person is a believer and he knows a little bit about uh, IT doesn't mean they can get in, right? They need to have the skills, right? To, uh, uh, you need to have a good media team, uh, ministry team, pastoral team, uh, 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 all the other teams within the church. You need to have it, right? Same thing in an organization. Have a sound recruiting process, right? Don't just hire arbitrarily. Get to know people. Get to know their background. Why do they want to join the organization, right? Uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, there are times when, you know, over the last, I would say, last two or three months, uh, we were looking out for, uh, you know, a member care coordinator in uh, here at APC. And so, you know, some of us from the pastoral team, we interviewed a few folks, uh, very good believers, right? uh, very nice, very you know, genuinely want to serve the Lord. They have a heart. And I remember this uh, one interview. This happened, I think late 2022 maybe november 22 and we were in the, in the interview and you know one of the pastors asked this person who was applying for the job good believer worked in ministry for about you know six seven years uh and you know uh, and so the pastor asked the question what what is member care ministry according to you and this person had no idea what it was right he's applied for that position and for a member care coordinator, but he had no idea what it is. He said, no, I have to just care for the members. And he just gave some answer, which was uh, not accurate at all. So what is the first thing we realized? Hey, he's not gone into the website. He's not gone into details. He's not gone and checked. What, what is it? What is the member care? What is the role description? Uh, he's just applied for it, but he's not gone through the role description. Uh, then we asked him what you want to be, you know, what is it that you want to do? He said, I want to be an evangelist. Now, if God is calling you to be an evangelist, and this job uh, of member care is only you're going to be given a laptop with a phone, and you have to call church members, talk to them, pray for them. So it's completely different. He said, my calling is to be an evangelist, uh, and but he's applied for a member care. So what will happen if you if we hire just because he is a believer, very good believer, right? Um, serving in ministry for many years. But if we hire him, what will happen? Over time, maybe over a year, he'll feel, oh, uh, you know, 
you know, hey, this is not what God has called me to do. I don't think even a year, in six months, he, he may just leave. Why? Because that's not his calling. If you feel sad and higher, oh, he's, a, he's in ministry, it's only going to affect the organization. We're going to spend all the effort of training this person, uh, you know, taking time, training this person, going through everything in the process of, uh, in terms of member care, and then in six months, if he leaves, it's such, uh, it's going to affect the organization. So higher right, reaching the best. There are some people uh, whom you have to, whom you have to do everything you possibly can to retain in an organization, right? But you cannot force people to stay, right? When people leave uh, an organization, uh, let it be an opportunity to learn uh, how we can make things better, right? Uh, and usually, most organizations, most companies have an exit interview, right? And the exit interview, they would ask, you know, uh, how is your, you know, how how was your work uh, for the past five years, ten years, whatever? Um, what did you learn? And uh, as an organization, how did you uh, like our organization? Do you have any feedback for our organization in terms of how we are treating people, in terms of our uh, communication standards? And so there's usually an open and an honest exit interview. But here are two important points. One, have a structure of hiring, whether corporate, whether ministry, have a structure. And two, hire with regards to the potential that they have right next point treat people the way you like to be treated luke 6 31 and 36 do for others just what you want them to do for you be merciful just as your father is merciful now this is a simple but a powerful principle while working with people right you treat others the way you want to be treated. I want to be treated in a very loving way, in a good way. People should accept me for the way I am, for the way I dress up, for the way I speak. Now, I need to also accept the others. I need to treat people the way I'd like people to treat me. Right? If, if I make a mistake, how do I want people to uh, correct me? Right. Is it to correct me in public, or is it to ridicule, or mock me, or condemn me, or is it to bring out my correct me in love and uh, you know help me to overcome that challenge and to you know become stronger in that area? Right. So treat people the way you want to be treated. If you treat an employee well, remember that employee will give you hundred percent to the organization. You you treat your people well in the church, right? In a church, in a ministry, if you treat them well, and I say treat them well, you respect them, you honor them. They may be rich, poor, they may be just you know, may not have too many skills. That's all right. But if you treat people well, they will give hundred percent to the church, to the organization itself. Right? Now, it would be wrong for the employee to keep expecting goodness and mercy shown to him and not fulfill their role with good performance, hard work, commitment, and loyalty. Okay? Now, I can't keep saying, okay, now let's be good, let's be good. Yes, we'll be good. But I can't keep showing, you know, mercy is shown, goodness is shown, yes. But there's always a time when for the interest of the organization or the company, we have to make sure that we treat employees well, even if they fail, uh, you know, to give back to the organization, but help them in productivity, in their performance, and then take appropriate actions. And so for example, somebody is in your organization, you've been correcting them for past six months, and you're not seeing any productivity, you know, just call them, talk to them. And then again, tell them, see, this is the second time I'm going to talk to you. I'm not seeing any productivity. I'm seeing that you know, the way that you're working is still the same. Uh, so I'm going to give you another three months. 
let's see if you, you know, I want you to become productive, give them uh, you know, action steps to follow, uh, see if they're able to follow those steps and, and then take appropriate action, right? Warn, but never threaten or abuse, right? Ephesians chapter six, verse eight and nine. Remember that the Lord will reward each of us, whether slave or free, for the good work we do. Masters, behave in the same way toward your slaves and stop using threats. Remember that you, your, you and your slaves belong to the same master in heaven who judges everyone by the same standard. Now, yes, we have earthly bosses and earthly leaders that we must be, you know, we must work under, but ultimately God is our boss. Right? God is our employer. And Paul writes it in many places, do everything uh, as if you're doing it unto the Lord, right? Uh, but do not threaten or abuse your employees. Do not threaten or abuse your team members or the people who are working with you. In ministry, there is plenty of threatening and abusing that's happening, right? Mm. Well, and it's sad to say that some, some of the ministries are, are you know, uh, threatening uh, believers by saying, if you don't give to God, this is what can happen to you. you know, or this is what you, uh, can, you know, in the future you may have, go through this and that. What is that? It is threatening. And then if people don't give, sometimes these leaders, they abuse them. The reason you are poor is because you're not giving. The reason you're like this, uh, and what's happening? It is demoralizing people. Yes, uh, uh, because a threat can inflict pain, injury, damage, and it can really you know, bring somebody down. But we can warn people. Now, all through the Old Testament, we see this. No? What does God do? He's warning the people of Israel, but he never threatens them. He doesn't abuse them. A perfect example of Jeremiah. He was there before, during, and after the fall of Jerusalem. We don't see God threatening Israel and abusing Israel. He doesn't do that. That's not in his nature. He warns them, hey, you know, you need to make things right. Otherwise, I'm going to let my hand off and the Assyrians are going to come and destroy you. So I'm telling you, don't do this. But even through that warning, what does he say? Later on, Jeremiah 28, 29 onwards, he says, I have plans for you. He doesn't threaten. God doesn't threaten and say, the people of Israel, you saw, now you're in captivity. Now, if you don't turn back, the captivity will keep increasing and it will, you know, you will be a people like this only. No. But he says, in all of this, I warned you, look at Hosea. Hosea was a, you know, Hosea 6 says, come, let's return to the Lord. Right? Uh, we have bruised him, we have, we have hurted him. And he has also allowed things to happen to us, but he's willing to heal us. So the nature of God himself is a God who is a God of love. right? And so if we are his children, whether we are employee or employer, uh, we do not warn, I mean, we do not threaten, we do not abuse people. That's not something that we must do. Right? Yes, we can warn people. We can, you know, for example, uh, I remember many years back, there was this volunteer, in, and this volunteer in church was, uh, you know, he had a problem, you know, every now and then he would drink. Uh, and he was, he's he's been serving for, for years, but, uh, uh, you know, I remember telling him, hey, you know, you can't, you know, be a volunteer and uh, be involved in this. People will, you know, find out, people will say, hey, what is this happening? And it's not in our guidelines. You need to um, take a break. Either you stop drinking and smoking or two, you've got to take a break from volunteering. Uh, but he said, I will stop. And uh, But every now and then some of the others would come and say, hey, you know, I'm getting this uh smell and this odor from him either he's been drinking or smoking uh 
And many times, uh, we may, as leaders, have to come to a place to warn, to tell them, hey, uh, if you're not doing this, now warn, when I say warn, it's not like, oh, it's, there's a way of doing it, right? So uh, we can just say, you know, uh, I've noticed that I've given you two, I've spoken to you two times, I don't see a change, so I would request you to step down from the volunteering team for now. Get your life straight, just go back to God, ask God to help you, and then you can come back join any of the volunteering teams and serve again so that way we are we are not threatening we're not abusing him or her but what we're doing is we're just putting it straight and we're saying if you don't change um you cannot be serving or volunteering in this area right so uh so there's a way to do things warn people not threaten or abuse them next point empower people for high performance right? empower people for high performance uh there's a lot that we can learn you know, you know from god's design from god's creation i right? look at proverbs 30 24 to 28 there are four things which are little on the earth but they are exceedingly wise what are those four things the ants are a, a people of are people not strong yet they prepare their food in the summer the rock badgers are a feeble folk, yet they make their homes in the crags. The locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. The spider skillfully grasps with its hands, and it is in the king's palaces. Right? You see those four. There's so much we can learn from creation. And these are just four examples, right? Uh, the ants and locusts both teach us about empowerment, teamwork, and high performance. You know, something interesting about ants, you know, it's they are very powerful. They are, they have a vision, you know, I'm sure you've seen these one or two red ants moving around at your home. Now they're not just moving around. It's not that they lost their way. You know what they're doing? They are searching for food. Now, when they have searched for the food and when they found it, they go back and bring the entire team. And that's where you see that line of ants. Because initially, one or two ants have gone searching for it. And no matter what you do, you break the line, they go, they'll come back to that place. They know what teamwork is all about. Right? High performance. They know how to get things done. Now, they don't have a team leader. They don't have hierarchy. They all just work together as a team. Right, Proverbs 6, 6 and 8, I'm sure we all know this. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, no overseer or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food for the harvest. Right? There is no command center to tell the ants what to do, and yet things get done. Whether it is collecting food, building a nest, they teach us about the, about the power of spontaneous teamwork. Now, every ant feels empowered because there's no leader. There's no overseer. There's not like one ant standing and watching everyone. No, everyone are working together, right? And the ants are working hard in the summer because they know when the winter comes, they will not be able to. And I have to do this to survive. So everyone in their mindset is, it's summer. I have to work. I can't do this alone. I need my, I need my fellow ants to help me. And only then we can all have food for the winter. So if I don't do this, I will not have food. And if I don't have food, I will die. So consider the ant. They are so wise, right? Locusts are normally solid, solitary, meaning they're, you know, they don't work in teams. But under certain conditions, like when there's heavy rain or drought, they come together in storms. And a swarm of locusts can have millions of them. Remember the plague of locusts? Usually you don't find locusts in swamps, right? You, you, they're always one here, one there. But when they move together in the swamp, there is no leader, there is no captain, and no one locust is important. We are all united. Yet they move in an you know, orderly manner. Great flexibility. They are unstoppable and they can wreak a 
great devastation. So we're seeing here the importance of high performance. Right? Now, in ministry, we need to be high performance. We need to push our, our ourselves. Right? Uh, push yourselves. Even now, try to push yourself. God, I gotta do this. This is the, you, you look at what you know what you want to do. You have a vision, like whatever ministry that God has called you for. Now, I remember as a Bible college student, the day I joined Bible college, I said to God, God, I want nothing but your presence. I want nothing but to grow in you. I don't care. It doesn't matter about you know what food is there. Whether there is food, there is no food, whether the food's tasty, it's not tasty, it doesn't matter whether you know all these other things, it doesn't matter at all. I said, God, two years. I'm gonna give my heart, my soul, everything that I can. I just want to learn. I want to grow. I want to do this. Right. And 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 I and I knew that nothing can stop me because I just wanted to do it. I spent many, many, many. I remember those one-hour breaks. You know, quickly finish up lunch, and then you know the next. You know, probably thirty minutes. I'd sit and try and read something, or you know, practice some songs on the guitar, something fruitful. And I remember just pushing myself to learn to go, uh, go out of my comfort zone, and. There will be times when you know God will push us, but it's not always about being comfortable. There will be times God will push us, right? And when He pushes us, He gives us the grace to do it, right? Uh, you now, at times we we may, He may ask us to spend more time in prayer, more time in reading the Word. Now, you know, if you are in the corporate sector, He may ask us to spend more time in you know uh, innovations and strategies and. Uh, you know, just seeking him for greater ideas and better ways to implement these ideas. So, if we want high performance, yes, there's a natural thing that we must do, but we must also look to God because He is the one who can give it to us. He grants us the grace, and we'll be able to do it. Right? And I, I remember when I was, you know, finishing my second year course, I just felt, oh man, this two years went so fast. I wish I could. Even even before graduate, we, we just graduated, and then uh, the new batch came, and then immediately we were teaching the new batch. So then I knew if I have to teach the next batch, and you know I hadn't even finished my uh, final semester exams, and uh, and we were already given the subjects to teach in the next semester. So I was a student. And we were already given subjects to teach for the next, so the first years who come into the next semester. So I was telling myself, and it's easy to preach. It's easy to you know take a, a couple of verses, preach 30, 40 minutes. You can do that. I've done it. But teaching, I realized, oh man, I need to learn so much more. I'm just finishing my two years course. I need to learn so much more. God, help me. And that should be there in us, like a desire high performance to just get better and better in what we are doing right finally let's look at this one point and then we'll close remember sweetness of the lips increases learning it's proverbs 16 21 and 24 the wise in heart will be called prudent and sweetness of the lips increases learning pleasant words are like a honeycomb sweetness to the soul and health to the bones Learning takes place best in supportive, positive, and encouraging environment. Right now, we cannot force people to learn. But when we're in an environment where we people are encouraged to learn, encouraged to, um, to you know, and they're supportive, they're positive, then it is wonderful. And create an environment where people are encouraged to ask questions. Uh, people are, uh, you know can critique others' works, meaning they can ask questions, find out why is it done in this way, challenge the status quo, think outside the box, bring out different perspectives, and all of this done in a healthy, positive manner. 
as a leader, encourage continuous learning. He talked about that, right? The moment I say, I don't learn, the moment I stop learning, I stop being an effective leader. The moment I stop learning, I stop becoming an effective leader. If you really want to grasp something, uh, and, and if you really want to tell some, communicate something to your team, and you want to do it in a, uh, do it in a way that they will grasp it, speak politely, gently, positively, with an encouraging manner. Sweetness of the lips increases learning. Pleasant words are like honey. They encourage, they refresh, they inspire a person. Right. Uh, so we couldn't finish this chapter, uh, but we will finish it next week. Uh, any questions? Any questions? Right. No questions? OK. All right, shall we just close in prayer quickly? Uh, right. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this time. We thank you for teaching us from your scriptures, oh God, uh, how you have called us to be, to, to Lord, to love one another, even as we uh, work in the corporate sector or in ministry, help us to be people-oriented, help us to be kind, loving, generous, merciful, just as you are to us. God. We pray, God, that you grant us the wisdom uh, to handle, to deal with people, uh, and to be a blessing, oh God. We thank you for each and every student. We pray a blessing over their lives, even as they learn the different courses. Uh, I pray, God, Holy Spirit, that you will just minister to them and speak to them, Lord. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. I'll see you on Wednesday. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. God bless.